Hello everyone and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. My name is Sarah Scully and I'm your host and um, thank you uh, to all of our new subscribers. We've had a few people join in the last month or so and um, I just want to welcome you and say thanks for following along. This um, podcast or YouTube uh, series, however you want to call it, um, focuses on a range of different crafts that my husband and I uh, practice. And that ranges from fiber arts, so knitting uh, primarily, also some spinning, as well as uh, quite a bit of natural dyeing of yarns, um, and that's what today's episode will focus on. But we also talk about our travels, um, we talk about homebrewing, um, which is Rick's uh, favorite hobby, and um, we also share recipes and even occasionally cocktails on the channel. So if you are interested in any of those things, I would say go ahead and subscribe. And um, if you're here for something other than fiber arts today, go ahead and check out our other playlists on the channel. You might find a topic that is of uh, greater interest to you. So um, thanks once again for coming back. Like I said, today's episode is all about um, a natural dye uh, experiment, and it's another new one to me this season, um, and it's black hollyhocks. Um, now this plant, uh, the the correct biological name for it is Alcea, and it is not native to North America. So we're located in Vermont in the northeastern United States, um, and this plant is not native to this area. Um, so my source for the flowers this time around was from a friend of ours. Hi Becca! Um, she graciously let me come over to her garden and pick um, most of her black hollyhocks. Um, this is a biennial plant and it does uh, grow well in our region, it's just not native to this part of the world. Um, it's originally from parts of Asia and Europe. So if you live in North America, it's unlikely you're just going to be, um, come across this plant growing in the wild. You would probably have to cultivate it in your own garden. The good news is it seems to be pretty easy to cultivate and I think once you get going, um, it does reseed itself fairly well. So um, that's something I'm looking forward to um, starting out my own dye garden. Hopefully next spring I can get some seeds going. Um, now th this is a biennial plant, so it takes two years to flower. And I believe then after that point the, the plants tend to die off permanently. Um, so you would get a harvest potentially every other year, depending on um, how frequently you're sowing. Obviously you could sow seeds each year and then you would get plants in, in alternating years. Um, the other thing I'll say is that today I'm focusing on the black variety of the hollyhocks in particular, um, but you can get colors from other, uh, you can get dye from other colors of hollyhocks. So they come in a wide range of shades from a, a very pale uh, lavender, almost a white color, um, through various shades of pink and purple, and then of course into the black. Um, and I'll put a picture up here while I'm talking just so you can see those plants. They have a long stalk. Um, the plants themselves are fairly mundane. They have sort of a, a lily pad effect with large leaves uh, that are, that grow near the ground and then the, the plant itself sends up this very long flowering stalk and all the flowers are clustered along that long um, stem and it's the, really the petals of the flowers that we're using for this dye process. That's what contains the pigment. So when you're picking the flowers you want to pick just the flower heads and um, I notice that they seem to pick off fairly well just in my hand, but you could also use scissors to trim them off. And then when you go to prepare your dye bath, you want to um, just pull the petals off of the flower. Um, now this is the color that I got. Um, I knew that black hollyhocks was good for getting a blue shade, and um, as we know from reading natural dyeing uh, source, source books and materials, blue is a very difficult color to achieve. Um, the only other plants that I know of, and I'm not an expert, um, are plants that carry the indigotin molecule, which are indigo and woad. Those both carry a form of indigo. Um, so hollyhocks um, has some other kind of a pigment, and I'm, I apologize, I don't know exactly how this pigment originates, um, but it does produce a blue shade. And the nice thing about hollyhocks is that you can use the um, a kind of ready-made uh, dye process, which I'll talk about in a second, that I use with other natural plant materials. So it's essentially heating up dye water with your plant material in it, 
um, extracting that dye and then putting your yarn in and that will absorb the dye and then you turn your turn your heat off and let your yarn rest um, for things like indigo and indigo derived uh, plants you have to somehow ferment or extract that color in an oxygen deprived environment that's also alkaline. So there's a lot more um, chemical factors in the indigo process and it is a bit more labor and time intensive um, for, for the indigo process. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're looking for an easier blue um, pigment. Um, I know that some dye suppliers of, of natural dyes do supply dried hollyhock flowers so you could order a package of those if you're not going to grow them yourself or if you don't have space to grow them. Um, and that would give you the opportunity to try these out. Now I just held up this skein. Um, so this was my superwash wool. Um, this is a commercial yarn base that I buy um, when I teach classes and also if I just want to you know, quickly try out some yarns. Um, it's an affordable option. And then this other one that I'm kind of holding up with it was from the same dye bath. But this is um, Shetland yarn that's milled locally. It's actually milled up in upstate New York. And this, um, the fibers are from our flock and also the flock um, of a neighbor of ours. And you can see that the intensity of the color, just like in last week's episode with the Black Eyed Susan, the intensity of the color between the two is a bit different. The superwash yarn definitely is uh, darker and more saturated. And then this yarn, even though it's showing up a little bit lighter on camera, it is kind of a, a pastel blue I would almost say this reminds me of winter sky um, with a very light blue and this reminds me more of a summer sky with a more saturated um, sky blue color. But they're both very pretty and they both took the dye fairly well. Um, now I will say, I mentioned this last week, when I was dyeing this round I thought that I had mordanted both of these. Um, at first it turns out I had only mordanted the superwash and so Originally, when the Shetland went into the dye bath, it did not absorb any color. So what I did, um, just like with the Black Eyed Susans, I pulled everything out of the dye bath, kind of in a panic, and then I went ahead and mordanted my two skeins of the Shetland um, for about an hour, and then put them back in the dye bath, and then they proceeded to take up the color. Um, so you definitely do need a mordant with hollyhocks. Um, I used alum because it's really my go-to and as I'm learning more about natural dyeing and understanding the properties of the different dye sources, I've, I've really been wanting to um, keep a consistent variable in terms of the mordant that I'm using so that I can see how all the different dyes look on that particular mordant. And alum is a good, fairly universal mordant. Um, it does not work with everything 100% of the time. But I would say nine times out of ten at least, you're going to get a nice saturated color that's fairly true to what's typical for that plant. Um, so you're not going to get a, a lot of shift in terms of what you were expecting versus what you get. Um, with other mordants, they can also be quite effective, but they can also shift your colors. For instance, copper can turn things greenish, um, as you might expect with copper oxidi uh, uh, oxidizing. Um, iron can tend to turn things um, either a duller shade or a more purple shade, depending on what the dye is. So that's why I've stuck with alum. It's not the only mordant that will work with hollyhocks. I know that iron will also give you a nice saturated blue. Um, but, you know, feel free to experiment with those mordants um, on your own and see what kind of results you get. Now, the other thing that I will say about um, this particular experiment is that I didn't have a ton of flowers. I had I had one picking, and I would say I had the flowers from about five plants. So it was, you know, half a shopping bag full of blooms, but it was not probably as many as I would have used. And so that's part of the reason that I got a lighter shade of blue. I think you can get more intense shades of blue. I've seen people who have gotten more uh, medium blues, um, shades of color, so hard to describe, um, but I would say more of a robin's egg or more of a, an even uh, slightly more saturated blue. Um, I don't know if it's possible with hollyhocks to get a really dark, like a navy um, blue. 
So that's something to read up on more. Um, if any of you have experience dyeing with hollyhocks and you've gotten more intense shades of blue, I'd love to hear about that. Um, blue is my favorite color, so any any kind of dye that will give me um, different shades of blue is always of interest to me. And um, but I also know that with with natural dyes, sometimes um, there seems to be kind of a maximum saturation or a maximum darkness of shade that you can get. Um, in my own experience, jewelweed is one of those where you know I've made a dye bath where I have boiled down the jewelweed, fished out the plant matter, kept that same dye vat, added more plant matter, boiled that down, added more plant matter, boiled that down, kept straining, kept trying to intensify the dye vat, and at some point you're still going to get tangerine orange. Um, you're never going to get like a burnt orange or a darker um, autumnal shade, you're just going to get this tangerine kind of color. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, the, the more intense the dye vat, the faster jewelweed dyes, and I would say um, the more passes through the dye vats, so you can fish your first yarn out and then put different yarn in and get still get an intense color. Um, so that's where adding more plant matter can benefit you. But in terms of getting a darker shade, I just don't see that with jewelweed, at least in, in my experience. So I am kind of curious about the hollyhocks. I know I've seen some people get darker than what I'm showing here on screen, but I'm just not sure how how dark you can ultimately get um, with the hollyhocks. Now I did mention this is from the black hollyhocks flowers, and my understanding is those have been bred by people um, to have the black flower. So that's not a natural occurring uh, color. Um, but like a lot of plants, we've taken things from nature and we've bred them to have other properties. Um, and I know that you can get uh, pinks and reds and oranges from some of those pink and purple um, shades of hollyhocks. So that's also something that I'll be interested in investigating next year is seeing what other shades I can get from the same plant. Um, I think that's all I have to say about this for this week. Um, but thank you for joining me. I know I'm in a little bit different location and I hope the lighting's all right for you. This is my uh, craft room slash guest room. Um, and you'll see some more yarn and things behind me. I'll talk about some of that in a future episode because I've been also um, doing some other dyeing projects with acid dyes. Um, but like I said, um, I try to share different things on the program. And so over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about eco printing. Uh, Rick and I have a another brew that we've done that will be ready for tasting in about three weeks. I also have some events coming up and some other kinds of projects uh, that I've been working on including a test knit um, that I just finished the knitting on about half an hour ago. Um, I do have to wash and block it so that'll be coming up after um, it's finished. but And I also have some new patterns coming out. So lots to look forward to in the next few weeks. Um, please do stay tuned, especially if you are uh, a fan of the fiber arts. I'd say that's probably most of our content, but like I said, we also do share cooking and brewing and other things. So let us know what else you're interested in. Um, maybe we'll have some overlap on some hobbies and we can talk about some, uh, some new content here on the channel. In the meantime, happy crafting. Let us know what you're up to. Let us know what you're trying, what new techniques you're trying, or new experiments you're doing, and how those are turning out. We'd love to hear from you and learn from you as well. Take care, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.